This is an overview of what we are going to cover in this talk. First of all, I will spend some time to talk about what is explainability, why it's important, and then we are going to discuss the way in which we can categorize explainability methods. In particular, I will make a brief comparison between Lime and SHAP. Then my colleague Anna will focus in detail on the open source library SHAP, so she will go into the maths behind SHAP, the fundamental of this library. Then I'm going to apply that to a real-world learning trend problem, so I will illustrate to you a specific case study using Trisha. And finally, some warnings. So let's get started. What is explainability? We know that in the last few years, artificial intelligence applications have become more and more sophisticated and often operate like algorithmic black boxes for decision-making that have an impact on people. Due to this fact, some questions naturally arise when working with these models. Why should we trust a certain decision taken by these algorithms? Why and how was this prediction made? Which variables mostly influence the prediction? The most crucial challenge with complex machine learning models is therefore their interpretability and explainability. All the paradigms underlying this problem fall within the so-called explainable AI field. According to Wikipedia, this is the formal definition of explainable AI that refers to methods and techniques in the application of artificial intelligence technology such that the result of the solution can be understood by humans. In machine learning, there is a trade-off between accuracy and explainability. Currently, machine learning models are evaluated using accuracy metrics, but in real-world data, the evaluation metrics may not be indicative of the product goal. I mean that the end goal is making the decision based on this prediction. But to do that, uh, we need to trust the prediction. If a user doesn't trust the model because he is not able to understand it, it will never use it or deploy it. So these charts give you the trend. In the x-axis, we have the accuracy. In the y-axis, we have the explainability. We know that uh, there are different types of models. Some of them are actually really intuitive, easier to understand. These are called white boxes, like linear models, logistic regression, single decision tree, and we know that they produce explainable results. Models like random forests and neural networks are called black box models. In fact, if you take a look at this model, you can spend hours just trying to understand what is going on there. We are more likely to obtain improved prediction with this model, but on the other hand, as you can see, they are not readable for humans, so during the last year, the interest to explain them increased too. Why and who need explanations? Well, from a technical perspective, explanations are useful for model debugging, increased detection of bias, and very fine accuracy. Of course, these are two model builders, data scientists, that want to use the explanation to understand why the model is not performing as they expect, they want to try to improve the model, help customers to achieve better outcomes. Then, explanations are important for building trust in the model output, building social acceptance, increased transparency. Of course, this is to the hand users of the machine learning system. It's hard to trust a system when you don't know anything about how it works on the inside. And finally, explainability is important for satisfying regulatory requirements and verifying model safety. Of course, this is to all the public stakeholders involved in regulatory and compliance for machine learning models. They need explanation to know if the model is safe and fit for its purpose. The customer has the right to obtain explanation. Now, why is important information retrieval? Why you will need to understand your model in learning to rank? Learning to rank is a class of technique that apply supervised machine learning to solve ranking problem. The popularity and widespread application of learning to rank models in prioritizing information in a variety of domains make their interpretability vital. The explanations are important to answer this question. Why a search result is at a certain position? For example, I'm searching for Californian holidays. Why this hotel is at the third position? I was expecting that this hotel to be at the first position. To respond to this question, of course, you can take a look to the score. Because if a certain item is at a certain position, it's because of its score. In learning to rank, we sort descending on the score from the model. 
but how does the model calculate this score? So why the learning to rank assign this score? Another question that are going to happen is, what is the most important feature in our model? Imagine an e-commerce. What is the most important feature affecting the ranking? It's like the number of sales, the review of the product, or a particular characteristic of a product, for example, I don't know, the color. Maybe we want to improve the content. We want to make it more attractive to the user. And if we know which are the features that mostly affect the ranking, we can improve that. And also it's important to know how is the feature value affecting the ranking. Finally, uh, another aspect could be, has the model heard any weird behavior? Of course, as I told you before, exploring the model, understanding model, can help you identifying this weird behavior, potentially identifying bugs in the model before going online to not end up with unsatisfying client. Now, uh, there are multiple approaches and methods. I just want to give you an idea on, of how to categorize the method with a useful uh, uh, explainability taxonomy. Of course, uh, um, one crucial factor that should be taken into consideration is the type of the data input, so the data you're working with to train your model. In fact, explainability is going to look a bit different for tabular text and image data. For example, for tabular data, explainability gives attribution value for each feature in our model to show how they influence the prediction. For text, explainability can tell us the word in a block of text that contributed to a model prediction, so the words that contributed most. Finally, for image, explainability can highlight the specific pixel or region in an image that caused a model to predict a certain level for an image, for example. Then, an important separation of explainability method is based on the type of the algorithms that could be applied. If their application is only restricted to a specific family of algorithms, then these methods are called model-specific, such as tree explainer and various techniques applied to deep learning models. In contrast, the method that could be applied in every possible algorithms are called model agnostic, and these approaches are essentially black box explainer, often very effective and straightforward straightforward to implement, but uh, this can come at the cost of less explainability than model-specific techniques. Another aspect uh, is, does it explain a particular sample or the entire model? There is a difference between local and global explainability. In fact, local explainability look at a single prediction and identify features leading to that prediction. Global explainability look at the model parameters and try to figure out how the models work globally. So, how to explain the whole model behavior. And then, how does the model work? Does it work separately from the model or does it visualize the model? In fact, we have visualization method and surrogate models that are interpretable models trained to approximate the prediction of a black box. Finally, when does the explainability occur? There are essentially three stages. Pre-modeling explainability that contains all the methodologies applied before building the model, where the goal is to understand and describe data used to develop models. Then we have the intrinsic explainability that can be achieved by designing self-explanatory models that incorporate explainability directly into the model structure. So, Explainability goal should be an integral part of the system, rather than an attachment. And finally, the post hoc explainability method involves looking at the relationship between feature values and models given prediction. We will focus on this stage. So, post modeling explainability is where the majority of scientists have focused their attention and research. There are numerous and diverse post hoc explainability methods, both for global and local explainability. We cannot list them exhaustively, but provide just a summary um, of the most popular approaches we see used by the machine learning community. We don't, we don't have time to go into the details of all these methods, but if you are curious, you can explore them. In fact, I put here references of some popular Python libraries for explainability, like 
any five lime shap hankers deep leaf that is specific for neural networks and also uh, references of other open source libraries too i mean these are essentially a package easy frame framework that include a comprehensive set of algorithms that cover different dimension of explanation i mean as you can see with the library shapash you can use uh, both lime and sharp method like the other um, and also for example with trusty ai that is based on partial dependence plot and a personalized version of lime this library is written in java rather than the other library that are written in, uh, in python now i will make a brief comparison between two of the most popular methods that are Lime and Sharp. Uh, Lime is often compared to Sharp, but there are important advantages and disadvantages between them. They are both uh, Python libraries, easy to install and to use. As suggested by the name, uh, for Lime the explanation are only local, while Sharp allows for both global interpretability and local uh, um, explainability. Lime is a model agnostic implementation, so can be applied to any type of models. The model agnostic implementation of SHAP is the kernel explainer, but you can see that SHAP has also several optimized explainer for specific model type, as tree SHAP, that is specific for the tree models, and we will see it later during the case study. They both use an important score, that is the most common type uh, of explanation family. It determines the form of explanation information and the higher the score, the more impactful the feature. The computation process to obtain the explanation is for both the perturbation method or input perturbation. I mean that Lime perturbs input data, so feature values around an individual prediction and capture um, the impact using a linear model, while SHAP, using the Shapley value, calculates the perturbation given by the introduction of a feature. The advantage of Lime is speed, while SHAP is computationally expensive, especially for large datasets. They are not optimized for all model types yet. For example, in SHAP, for a model like uh, Kanier's Neighbors, even on a very small dataset, the kernel SHAP is very, very slow, so it's better to use LIME. On the other hand, LIME cannot handle the requirement of XGBoost to use the XGBoost D-matrix on the input data, while SHAP is optimized for XGBoost and provide a readable result thanks to the tree explainer. If you have categorical variables, Lime is able to handle them, but it's not designed to work with one hot encoding data, considering that um, with Lime each data point is perturbed to create uh, the approximate model. And perturbing a one hot encoded variable may result in unexpected meaningless features. SHAP, on the other hand, uh, in general is able to handle uh, categorical data and uh, but it's not always easy to interpret the result. And finally, they can both work with all kinds of data. And now over to you, Hanna, to get to the earth of SHAP. Okay, so um, I will focus on the SHAP library and specifically on the uh, theory behind the library. So um, looking at how we um, can understand um, why we shop uh, give a specific importance to a feature instead of another one and also the um, the amount of importance that uh, it gives so for the explanation of this theoretical part i will rely on a blog post of samuel mazzanti you can find it in the link below and the SHAP library is based on a game theory approach called Shapley Additive Explanations. The aim of this tool is to explain the output of any machine learning model through the inspection of its predictions. Specifically, it describes the contribution that each feature gives to the model when it makes a prediction. We can indeed suppose that in our scenario, some features can be more important than others in the decision process, and SHAP helps us making this kind of uh, evaluation. 
As mentioned before, uh, the shop library is based on a game theory approach, and this kind of approach relies on uh, two components, a game and some players. Making a correlation with our machine learning context in SHAP, a game corresponds to the output of the model for one specific observation, while players are the model features. So what SHAP does is quantifying the contribution that each player brings to the game. And what SHAP does is quantifying the contribution that each feature brings to the prediction made by the model. It is important to point out that the game in SHAP concerns a single observation, therefore it gives us a local interpret interpretability of the model. So um, let's take an example to see how the importance of a feature is determined in the sharp play additive explanation. Suppose to use a linear regression to predict the income of a person. And suppose also to have uh, three features in our model, so age, gender, and job. To understand which is the importance of a feature, we have to consider the outcome of all the possible combination of players, and so in our case, uh, of features. In our scenario, we have to consider all the possible combination of F features, with F going from zero to three, and where three is the total number of features that our model can consider. This set of possible combinations can be represented as a tree, so it's a bit, okay. Uh, where each node contains a specific combination of features and each edge represents the marginal contribution that each feature gives to the model. So in our example, we start from a set of zero features, the root of our tree. We then pass to single feature per node in the second row, so age, gender, and job. Then to combination of two features in the third row and to the complete set of features in the list. The edges, as mentioned before, represent the marginal contribution brought by a feature. So if we look at the first two rows, we can say that the edge from node one to node two is the marginal contribution that age brings to the model, starting from a node in which no features are considered. The second edge represents the marginal contribution that gender brings to the model, starting again from a node that considers no feature. The same for the second and the third row. So the add from node three to node five represent the marginal contribution that age brings to the model, starting from a node that only has the gender feature, and so on for the other edges and nodes. This set of combination is called a power setting map and the cardinality of this set can be computed with the formula q squared to n. So in our example, we have a total of eight possible combination of features. To compute the importance of each feature, SHAP requires training one model for each of the nodes of our tree. Therefore, eight models. These eight models will be identical in their setting and training data. The only difference will be the set of features on which they are trained. This is good for our example to understand the theory, but uh, let's imagine uh, to have a training set with uh, 100 features. This will require the training of two squared 100 models. So this uh, becomes so impractical and expensive. In fact, SHAP applies a variation of this naive approach in its implementation. From what explained before, let's suppose to have trained a model for each of the nodes, and therefore combination of features of the tree. And in our case, we have eight models. Suppose also to consider one specific observation, X, to give us input of these models, and to observe the prediction that each of these models made on this observation. In the image, we can see the income that is predicted from each model given the X observation in input. If we focus on the age feature specifically, 
we would like to know what is the overall contribution that age brings to the model. In order to do so, we have to consider the marginal contribution that age brought to the models. And to do this, we have to consider that uh, all the contribution of age. So all the models where age is present. From the formula I report here, we have an example of a marginal contribution. So in this case, we are computing the contribution brought by age to the model containing only age as a feature. So we start from the income predicted by the model with no feature, so the node one, and we um, subtract the uh, income obtained uh, from the second model, so the one for the node two, uh, that predict uh, an income of $40,000. Uh, and then we can uh, see which is the impact that age brought to the, to the output of the model. So to compute um, the overall contribution of age, we have to consider all the marginal contribution. So in this tree, we can see in red all the edges where uh, we have to consider for this aim. Specifically, we have to consider all the edges starting from a node that doesn't contain the edge feature and ending on a node that contains the edge feature. So as we have seen before, the edge from node one to node two respects the condition. The same for the edge between node three and node four, the node four and node six, the node seven and the node eight. Putting together all these contributions, we have the formula for the computation of the shut value for the edge feature and specifically for the X observation given in input. We can see that the formula is weighted average of the marginal contribution. So now uh, we ask ourselves how we can compute these weights. So the main assumptions to compute the weights are that the sum of the weights on each row of the tree should be equal. Therefore, for our tree, the value of weight W1 should be equal to the sum of W2 and W3 which should again be equal to W4. Second, each weight inside a row of the tree should be equal. Therefore, uh, for our tree, W2 should be equal to W3, as we can see also again here. So the values that meet this condition for our example are uh, W1 and W4 equal to one third and W2 and W3 equal to one sixth. Repeating the process for all the features, we obtain the uh, sharp value for the age, that is minus $11.33,000. The sharp value for gender using the same process, so minus $2.33,000. And again, for the job. If we sum up uh, together all these values, we obtain an income of $33,000. And we can notice that this value is exactly the difference between the output of the model and the output of the dummy model with no feature. This is the reason for the theoretical approach name that is sharply additive explanation. Then I report here uh, on the slides also the um, generalization for um, the process to uh, arrive at the formula that is presented in the paper of the sharp values. And I will not talk about this in, uh, in this meeting, but I will let uh, them on the slide. So if you want uh, later, you can read them and uh, uh, take all the, the, the observation you want on this. So I skip them and Okay, I let up to Ilaria. Okay, Anna, thank you again. So now uh, the case study. Let's imagine to have an ebook e commerce. We collect all the interaction made by the user on the website. We manipulate them in order to build the training set. 
And we end up with a lot of features like uh, sales done the last week, uh, total sales, number of reviews, average, gender, price, order, and so on. And then we train our learning to rank model using Lambda Mart algorithm. And we use the library SHAP to understand the model behavior. Since Lambda Mart is based on tree, we can use tree SHAP, so the tree explainer. And now we are going to explore different type of plots that tree SHAP provides, each one highlighting a specific aspect of the model. Let's start from the summary plot uh, that give us a global explainability. This is also called bar plot. Variables are ranked in the sending order in the y-axis, so from the most important to the least important, with average impact on model output in the x-axis. This gives you just a feature, the feature important, but if you want to show the positive and the negative relationship of the feature with the, with the target variable, you have to produce the summary plot with a different style. So this is another type of summary plot. And how can you read it? This plot show not only the variable importance from top to bottom in the y-axis, as already said, but also show how the feature values using the color spectrum from blue to red affect the prediction. So on the x-axis, we have the impact on the model, positive or negative impact. Uh, each point is a prediction result. So high value of the feature is represented in red, while low value with blue. And important, gray dot represent null values. So you can see that the book sales features does not have value in some observation, and this has a negative impact on the model. We can see that the most important feature are book sales last week, book reviews. So high value of book review um, or uh, book sales last week is impacted positively, positively uh, for uh, most of the cases, the score of the document. So it means that the higher the number of review, the better the score and vice versa. Then we, we, have, uh, we have also a mixed situation like uh, book price feature, for example. Uh, this is difficult to understand because it's confused now. We don't have a clear distinction between red and blue. So between low and high uh, value of the feature. Then we have also a series of categorical uh, features encoding using Wahot encoding. So these are one or zero. For example, yeah, in gender fantasy or is a book in this case, um, if the book, uh, uh, if the gender of the book is fantasy and if is an ebook uh, are impacting negatively. So of course, this gives you just a summary, a global view. So then interpreting the summary and understanding if is it correct or not, this, that's up to you, because sometimes you may have an intuition that could be that the model and the model learns something that, that is against your intuition. Another important plot, uh, uh, try to solve a different problem and Halo has to give explainability to a single model prediction. So uh, here we can see the model output, the base value, that is the value that would be predictive if we didn't know any feature for the current output and how and how much each feature impacts the output. In fact, feature pushing the prediction higher are shown in red and those pushing the prediction lower are in blue. And also the bigger the arrow, the bigger the impact. Uh, we want to show you two different plots uh, representing the same query, but different uh, product, different document. I mean, this plot is related to a document that is less relevant. In fact, we have an output of minus seven, and there are some features that lower the, the prediction. So all the blue arrow show you the feature that brought down the score. On the other hand, uh, we have a document with higher relevance, so we can see that we have an higher impact from some features that are increasing the score. So the red arrow show you the feature that brought the score higher. The score is minus 3.25. It is still negative, but is higher than the other. So this means that is more relevant. Then I will explain this concept later. The fact that the book doesn't have a romance genre and the holder is not Isaac Asimov impact negatively on the output while not being an ebook impact positively. If you want a global uh, representation, you can use a variant, a variant of the first plot. So imagine taking the previous plot 
and uh, place it vertically. So rotate it of 90 degrees and add the, the force plot of all the other observations side by side. You will get this plot that is interactive. So you save it in HTML format and you can open it using a browser and positioning on it with the, with the mouse, you can highlight a specific row and check how the features are impacting the score. Then we have the dependence plot that show the marginal effect that two features have on the predicted outcome of a model. In this case, this plot is a bit confusing and it's not easy to understand because actually uh, there is no correlation between these two features, book price uh, and its gender fantasy. So to better understand this plot, uh, I would like to show you uh, another example uh, taken from a different case study. In this case, the goal was predicting if people made over 50K in the 90s, so in the x-axis, we have the H, the first feature. In the y-axis, we have the predicted sharp value. And the color represents the second feature, so the education. Therefore, we can see if having a specific age and having a specific education impact positively or negatively on the model output. We can see that 20 as a value is impacting negatively the score. So um, then we go up with the age and we have a positive impact on the score. And then we go down after 60. This is correlated with the second features in the, the education. We can deduce, in fact, that uh, 20 years old with the high level of education has a lower impact on the score. The reason could be that maybe a young that works earn uh, more than a young that studies only. On the other hand, the plot is showing that at a certain age, a higher value of education is impacting more on the score than low value of education. Because maybe if you have a high education, you can achieve better job position and better salary potentially. Then exceeding 60, the plot is less defined. And finally, another plot, plot that is quite, quite important is the decision plot. Uh, that show how the uh, prediction changes during the decision process. So displaying the cumulative effect of each feature and each line uh, represents a single prediction. But again, to better understand this plot, uh, I, would like to, um, it, I would like to show you just uh, a plot with a single uh, one observation. So in the y-axis, we have the feature ordered by uh, importance as for the summary plot. In the x-axis, we have the output of the model. Moving from the bottom to the top, sharp values for each feature are added to the model base value. So we start from the base value and then each features contribute to the overall prediction. You can see the feature value between brackets if it's actually causing a negative or a positive impact. So for example, we start from here, we can see that having Isaac Asimov as author, on, of, as author of the book impact positively. In fact, uh, the line goes to the right. And then uh, if um, the book was not published in 2018, uh, the, the age uh, if for age uh, for, from 10 to 18 and having Shakespeare as author impact negatively. In fact, we go, uh, left, uh, lowering the value. So it will show you basically after each evaluation of each, of each feature, if we went negative or positive with the score. Now, I um, these are two slides uh, with a Python code about what described so far. So basically you have to import the necessary library, SHAP and matplotlib that, um, useful, that is a useful uh, visualization library uh, for rendering of the graph in Python. Uh, we set uh, the explainer, in our case, the tree explainer, and the plots are generated after the computation of the sharp values. So we use the tree sharp algorithms to estimate them for tree based model. Then this is just an example to show you how to save the plot using uh, matplotlib. And finally, I put here the code as an example to generate all type uh, of plot, but we will share the presentation slide after the meetup so you can consult uh, them later. Then some warnings. 
So first of all, attention on data pre-processing because for example, uh, the feature selection process can drop highly correlated training data feature, hiding the explanation and potentially leading the user to an incorrect conclusion. SHAP doesn't consider queries. In fact, uh, feature importance is computed on all the data like a unique set. So we have to be the one we are focusing on the query to see the importance of a feature for a query, we have to extrapolate all the interaction with the same query and then execute the plot just on that subset of data. Then the output, the score of the model is not the relevant label we use in training and testing. So the score represents uh, uh, the same concept if we look at the relative relevance between products. And also we have to pay attention of, on how we interpret the score because a negative value doesn't mean that the document is not relevant. We always have to consider it in relationship with, uh, to, the, to the other product in the same query. As I told you before, um, since minus three is greater than minus seven, the ranking of these uh, two results will be equivalent to both using the SHAP score or the relevance label. And finally, the conclusion. So explainability is a fundamental step in project that use machine learning models. It allows us to better understand the model behavior. As we have seen, there are several methods for explainability depending on the model we are using, the type of explanation we want, the data type. And one of the more promising is the Shapley values due to its solid uh, theoretical foundation. That's why SHAP, that is based on Shapley values, is a very powerful library that provide us several tools for explainability and allow us to give local and global explainability to the model. And as I already said in the warning slide, uh, keep attention on data pre-processing query and relevance during the uh, plot uh, uh, interpretation. Uh, finally, future words. We have, we have added to our to-do list the integration of the SHAP library in Apache Solar, since Solar allows to use the learning to rank model for the re-ranking of the document. It could be very useful to analyze directly the model behavior inside the platform. And then, of course, the exploration of other uh, explainability that library, that, but that they are more, thought, more specific for uh, ranking algorithms. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you are curious, you can take a look uh, uh, to our uh, blog post about explainability in our website. Thank you again. Uh -huh.